Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Here I am back in uh, the Twin Cities again, and uh, the new series of talks uh, will begin today. Will go on till the end of the week. Uh, today, I am going to talk on the Socratic theme: Know thyself. Why should Socrates have suggested that we should know ourselves? No one has ever said that one should know oneself. All knowledge is of something other than the self. What is there to know about the self? We are the self. It looks a little strange that this question should be asked. That is, what do we know what the self is? Of course, we are the self. What else is there to know about it? It looks funny that this thing should be repeated for centuries and should be handed down today to us as a question still posed and not fully answered. And then there are thousands of philosophers, poets, artists, yogis, who are all busy on this subject of knowing themselves. In India, we hear the story of a guy who went to a yogi and knocked at his door. And the yogi said, who is there? There was no answer. A second knock. And the yogi shouted, why don't you say who you are? No answer. Third knock. The yogi said, I say, who are you? And he said, if I knew it, I wouldn't be knocking at your door. I've come precisely for that question. This is the way we are posing this problem all the time. And the reason is a very simple one, why this question is being posed. The reason is that what is mine cannot be me. This creates all the problem. Whatever is mine could not be me. If I say this jacket is mine, then this jacket is not me. Because when I assert that this jacket is mine, I am presuming I am different from the jacket. Then alone it is mine. I possess it. I own it. I have it. It is something that belongs to me, is possessed by me, is something with me. But it cannot be me. Then the whole series of questions comes up. Don't we say, this is my body, then this body can't be me. Don't we say, these are my eyes, then the eyes can't be me. Don't we say, this is my mind, then the mind can't be me. Don't we say, this is my soul, then the soul can't be me. Don't we say, this is my God, then the God can't be me. Then what is me? All that we know about ourselves belongs to us, but there is not us. If it was us, we wouldn't say it's mine. We would say it is me. We have not yet been able to say, what is me? We are only able to describe that which belongs to us. Therefore, when we want to understand what is me, then the question arises, who is saying this is mine? Who is claiming? Who is the claimant? Who says this body is mine, this mind is mine, this soul is mine, this consciousness is mine, it's all mine. Who is claiming this? If we can discover the claimant who wants all these things to be his or hers, we would have an answer to the question, what is the self? Let us examine who is claiming that all these things are mine. This house is mine, this family is mine, these children are mine, this body is mine. Who is saying so? It does not take too long to find out that it is only human consciousness which says so. If we are not conscious and not human, no such claim is made. But for human consciousness, this claim would never have been made. If we did not have a conscious being, this claim is not possible. If we are unconscious, you cannot claim. It seems that this identity of the guy who says all this is mine is linked with his consciousness. Because without that, this claim cannot be made. And the one who is making the claim is the one who says he's the me to whom all these things belong. Then this human consciousness seems to provide a clue to what is the self. If that is so, then we can proceed pretty fast on the journey towards knowing ourselves. All we have to do is to know 
what is our consciousness how are we conscious what makes us conscious what makes us aware well it seems we may be aware because we have a brain we have a physical system which when alive create consciousness but that is not only true when we are sleeping in deep sleep our brain is there our body is there and we are alive but we are not conscious if it were merely our physical apparatus that generates consciousness then it could not be shut off with all these operations still on moreover if it was the brain in the physical body that generates consciousness then some types of consciousness do not appear to be coming from here some types of esp some types of recall of reincarnation in previous lives are clear indicators of functioning of consciousness outside the data available to the human brain and the human system even if we do not go to extra sensory perception but merely confine ourselves to perceptions but other than the wakeful perception we discover that we perceive things we experience things which are not part of the physical system some dreams are so interesting so fascinating that they seem to be occurring in consciousness which is not necessarily part of the physical material system they are way out far out and we can know it moreover we have found that the perceptive apparatus in the physical system which works through sense perceptions seems to take messages from what we call experience or the world around and from there it enters through the perceptive nervous system carries messages to the brain and it is only when we are conscious that the brain picks it up when we are not conscious the brain does not pick it up even though it's functioning consciousness seems to hold the key to any perception any experience i was once serving with a high political officer in india and one of the ministers in india was involved in a road accident and knocked down badly and he became unconscious he remained unconscious for 105 days he had no consciousness at all what was going on so we decided since he was a very important man we decided to get the best medical opinion available we looked for the best medical men throughout the world and we flew them into india to treat that vip one of the guys who claimed to have opened up more brains than anyone else as on that date he had opened up more than 1000 brains was in canada and that brain surgeon arrived and examined that patient and i and the other official we went to see that patient and talked to the doctor and we said doctor you have opened up more brains than anyone else we have one single question to ask you you are a man of ex some expertise and technical know how about the brain is tell us what makes a man conscious and he said sir this is a question which we have all been asking for thousands of years and have not found the answer he said i can tell you that this part of the brain will generate this kind of consciousness or shut off this kind of consciousness this part of the brain can shut off visual perception this part of the brain can shut off audio perception but what is causing conscious perception i cannot say because no one has found out i can say that some parts of the brain right in the center which descend down into the medulla oblongata which goes into the spine <coughs> that part if choked chokes off most of the perceptive apparatus but not all it still retains control over some of the motor activities but i cannot say that consciousness is controlled by that part because it is not we have very limited information on what constitutes consciousness and sir i am sorry i do not know what makes a man conscious this was the opinion of one who had who knew every bit of the brain 
who had opened it up, put it back and talked to the man whose brain he had opened up with that expert. It is quite obvious that what makes us conscious is not something that is material. It seems to be embodied in matter. It seems to function in this physical body, but it seems to be capable of experience which at some times tends to be outside the body. In a dream state, people have dreamt personally as a conscious experience that there were little birds that flew out of the windows. They were not birds. There was no similarity between their physical body and the bird that flew out of the window. They dreamt that they were birds that flew out. And when you put that question to another man, how can you say you were a bird when you are a man? You should say, I saw a bird flying out of the window. You shouldn't say, I was a bird and flew out of a window. And that dreamer says, no, but I didn't see a bird flying out. I could not see because I was flying out. I was the bird. Here is a conscious experience quite outside this physical body and carries the body with it in the form of a bird or otherwise and generating an experience of the whole world around that body which was outside from this physical body. Therefore, conscious experience seems to have capabilities of existing even outside this physical system, outside this physical body. A dream projects us outside this physical body and we walk around all over and come back and we awake. Consciousness then, that part of human self which generates experience could not be the physical body. No wonder we say this is my body and not that this is me. It is just proper that we say it is my body and not me because me is the consciousness that claims that I am using this body. What then is consciousness without the physical body? Can we by any methodology, by any systematic investigation find out what is consciousness without the physical body? Here the practitioners of the art of self-realization have devised very simple ways of finding out the nature of consciousness without the physical body. They have found out how you can study with some scientific precision, with some acceptable scientific methodology, the nature of human consciousness if it were existing without physical body or how it would exist if there was no physical body. The method used is a simple method which we all use in the process of learning. That method is concentration of attention. That's the only method we really know of. When we teach a child to learn what is in a book, how do we teach that child? The child is interested in the kids playing outside and is not concentrating on the book. We keep on saying, look there, look there, the child is th thinking of the kids playing outside. Then what do we say? We say, concentrate upon the book. What does that mean? We want the child not only to become aware of the book, it's already aware of the book. We want it to shut off the awareness of the kids playing outside. Concentration is the capacity in human consciousness to keep part of that consciousness in awareness and shut off the rest. The capacity to be aware of a part and become unaware of the rest. This very capability in human consciousness, which is called human attention, is used in a systematic, methodical study of human consciousness itself. How? We want to know what is human consciousness if it is not the body. Then we become unaware of the body and keep the awareness of human consciousness and we find out. What is human consciousness? The art of meditation, of which so much talk can be heard in this country today, is nothing else but the art of being yourself. And if yourself is consciousness and not the cover of the jacket of the human body, then the art of meditation is to withdraw attention or awareness 
from the physical body and fix it upon your own consciousness. Let us see how we could do it. We don't have to fix attention on ourselves because we are there. So the, uh, the whole art becomes simple. Instead of doing two things, fixing attention on this and withdrawing from there, we only do one thing, withdraw. The rest we are there already. We are awake, we are conscious. Remaining awake, that's important. I'm not going to sleep. Remaining awake in full wakeful awareness, we become unaware of the physical body by withdrawing attention from the physical body and concentrating upon that which appears to be awareness, which functions as awareness. What happens when we do that? When we really withdraw attention and we concentrate upon that part where we believe we are functioning in awareness, we gradually forget that we have a body. If I concentrate hard on this hand, very hard on this hand, after a while I will not know I have another hand lying here. Because I have withdrawn my awareness from the other hand to this one. In the same way, I first localize myself. I say, where am I as consciousness? Then I just be there. Now, where am I in consciousness? The self is where it believes it is, because we are not talking of any absolute ethereal self to be searched for. We are talking of the self that we know at all times. The self that we know exists where we believe we exist. Where do we believe we exist? We know we are aware of the hand, but that's not where we are aware from. When we try contemplate upon it, meditate upon it, understand it, think about it, do anything. Any conscious process is used to discover where are we operating from as conscious beings. We come to a point in the head. We close our eyes, we close perceptive apparatus. We don't want to be interested in what is happening through the sensory perceptions. We want to understand where the perceiver is. When we try to do that and just be within ourselves, the realization comes that the whole conscious functioning of thinking, contemplating, meditating is taking place somewhere up here, somewhere behind the eyes. That's how we feel in the wakeful state. Each one of us feels the same way. When we want to remember in consciousness, in memory, when we want to think in consciousness, we go here. We don't uh, slap our sides. We put our hand on our head if we can't think. Our whole Awareness of awareness is over here. And we know it is somewhere up there. Well, that's where we feel, we believe, we experience we are. Then why not start from there? Wherever we believe we are, we want to be there. We just want to be ourselves. When we contemplate upon ourselves as we believe we are in consciousness, not as the physical system, and we gradually forget that we have feet also attached to us. The longer we contemplate, the more we are likely to forget. The more we forget, the more unaware we become of our physical system. Eventually, we can lose awareness completely of the physical body and yet retain full awareness of that which thinks, which feels, which knows, which contemplates. When we have that, we find that we can still see through imagination. Of course, we can see. We can still hear, we can still touch, we can still walk. How come that we were associating these activities only with the physical body? We never knew that even if we left the physical body or the awareness of it, we would still have the same perceptive experiences. It is like this. Like you are all sitting here on these chairs. And if I were to suggest your physical body should stay where they are. Remain seated on your chairs in your physical cells. But imaginatively, walk up here. Along the, avoid the chairs, other chairs, walk up along the aisle, come up, shake my hand tightly, shake my hand tightly, then turn around, go back, shake your chairs. 
My life said this, you have done it. You have in fact walked, come past and gone back. How did you do it? You are still there. We commonly refer to it as having been done through imagination. What is imagination? It's a conscious function. But this we dismiss as an unreal function because we are convinced by an assumption that the physical must be real. An assumption for which we have no real basis. But we have assumed. I am not concerned with what is real or unreal. Right now I am concerned with the nature of the self. Irrespective of what is real or unreal, that question is too philosophical. We are right now concerned with discovering what is the self. What would constitute human consciousness if it became unaware of the physical body? And we know human consciousness is capable of doing a thing like this, going and coming back without using the physical body. Through conscious process, we might call it imagination. That conscious self which walked up the aisle, did it not have the power to see? Of course it did. It's all along. Did it not have the power to hear? Of course. It was listening. As I said, turn round and go, it listened. Did it not have the power to touch? Of course, shook my hand. Did it not have all the sensory perceptions? Of course. Then there is a part of consciousness, a definite experience in consciousness, which has the capacity to have all sense perceptions without the awareness of the physical body. When we discover that, a remarkable additional knowledge comes into our awareness. And that is that not only can we have sense perception independent of the physical body, that we have sense perceptions only because we have sense perceptions independent of the physical body. That what we experienced by way of imagination or consciousness was the only way of seeing, hearing, touching and feeling. That if that part, what, call, what we call the imagination or consciousness, was not there, this body with its eyes open, ears open, is incapable of seeing and hearing. We discover that we were wrong in assuming all the time that we saw because we opened these eyes. These eyes open without consciousness do not see. And consciousness without these eyes can see. It's a great knowledge that comes to us just by this one exercise of taking one step towards discovering what is the claimant, who is claiming this body is mine, who is the self. This body then was a cage which enclosed the conscious self. It limited the conscious self. It immobilized the conscious self. I could have flown with that conscious self out of a window. This body did not let me fly. I could have seen more than what is in front of me. These eyes do not let me see. I could have heard much more than what comes to this eardrum, but this eardrum does not let me hear. I was thinking that these sense perceptions built into the physical body enabled me to perceive. In fact, they restricted my perception. And this awareness comes when we actually perceive without the physical body. And yet that perception is no more than the physical body in the sense that we still claim that those were my eyes, those were my ears, that was my, my conscious self. What kind of a self? You are still claiming, consciousness is still claiming, those were my perceptive systems, those are my sense perceptions. Whose sense perceptions? We can't stop here. If we had found ourselves, we could have stopped there. If we are still claiming those were my sense perceptions, then sense perceptions is not me. Merely the capacity to see, hear, touch, smell could not be me. Then what is the self? Well, we follow the same learning process. Become unaware of sense perceptions, yet retaining full awareness of consciousness, of awareness of yourself. Remaining as awake as we are now, if not more, not going into a sleep or a trance or a samadhi or anything. Remaining as awake as we are now, become unaware of sense perceptions. And what is there to be aware of if we are not aware of perceptions through senses? There are other things which retain consciousness, which sustain consciousness without sensing. What, are, what is that part of the self which exists without sensing? The human mind. The human mind can perceive an abstract idea without having to see, hear, touch, smell. 
What part of consciousness perceives an abstract idea? It perceives, it knows. Human consciousness can even now experience perception without having to break it up into seeing, hearing, touching and so on. This is an imperfection in perception to break it into pieces, functional pieces that you can't perceive unless you see separately, hear separately, touch separately. What kind of perception is this? This seems to be a very limited kind of perception where you have to divide up functionally in order to perceive. The mind is capable of perception without breaking up into sense perceptions. And some perceptions which are not subject to sensory perceptions are being perceived by the mind even now. A very abstract kind of idea, an idea of the nature of beauty. Ideas such as an idea of God. You don't see, you don't hear, you don't touch. It's just an idea, but you perceive. Most of the abstract ideas are perceived by the mind without sense perceptions. Then can't the mind perceive everything without breaking into sense perceptions? Of course it can. How can we know it? We can know the functioning of the human mind by placing our attention upon the human mind, becoming aware of the human mind and unaware of sense perceptions and the physical body. Next step in meditation. Next step in being ourselves. When we do that, we discover our own mind in which experience as we know it, the world as we know it, can be perceived directly. Just a direct general perception of the mind without having to break it up. Now I'm seeing, now I'm hearing. Not that way. This direct perception of experience through the mind gives us knowledge of our own deeper self. And we discover, ah, now we know that was the part of self which claimed these senses are mine, this body is mine, this whole world is mine. We have come to that part of the self which thinks, that part of the self which senses. All sense perceptions picked up are ultimately fed into one part of consciousness called the human mind. And the function of sensing is really being done by one part of consciousness called the mind. All creativity in consciousness takes place in that part of consciousness called the mind. The mind is then continuously performing these functions, sensing, reasoning, creating. What are these functions? Sensing is nothing more than picking up through its direct perceptive system all the perceptions that come, that come through senses. That is the sensing function of the human mind. Reasoning is nothing else but the use of words or phonetic symbols, sound symbols or images sometimes in a certain order which flow through the mental stream all the time and create meanings within ourselves by the simple process of association of ideas. Association of ideas gives connotation to those symbols and we create a whole world by this process of reasoning or thinking. The middle part of the mind then is busy thinking and reasoning. The top part of the mind is busy in the creative function. What is the creative function? A reassembling of these elements of perception into new patterns, new designs, and seeing them thrown out into experience. Nothing is new in those things because they all come from previous sensory perceptions, previous sensing. The pattern and design is new, so we call it creation, the creative function. These are three functions the human mind is constantly performing and we can legitimately say now we have come to the self which does all this sensing thinking. Now we know who is claiming. But is it right to say that uh, this creative function is being performed by that conscious mind? Isn't there some limitation in the mind also? Like we discovered the limitation in the senses. The sense perceptions divided experience functionally. What is the mind doing? It is under a very big steel frame, which we didn't notice. Very tight frame. A very tight jacket it is wearing in performing these three functions. What is that jacket that now encloses the mind? What is the mind in terms of the jacket that it wears? It is tied down by a jacket called time, space and causation. Because none of these functions, sensing, thinking or creating, can take place except in time, space and causation. Each one of these functions 
need time and space and is an event. Then that means it is bound down. This consciousness is not our real self. We are still operating in a cage. The cage of time, space and causation. What are these things? Time, space and causation. Is this something real or is it just, just an idea? The German philosopher Kant attempted an answer which the Indian philosophers have accepted for thousands of years. That there is no such thing as time, space and causation. These are categories of the mind. These are the mind. What is mind? Mind is not consciousness. Mind is the experience of consciousness when seen through this frame. And the frame is the mind. When consciousness is pumped into experience with a beginning, a middle and an end, it's called mind. It's called mental experience. Mind then is nothing else except the capacity of consciousness to experience in time, space and causation. Then what is consciousness, which is using the mind? The mind is just another body there. Then what is consciousness? We have to then push further within ourselves to discover what the self is. It seems that Socrates was right. It is not that simple as we thought what the self is. Each layer of consciousness that we discover seems to have its own limitations. And we want to find the unlimited, true, uninhibited, free consciousness. Where is that? Then if mind suffers from this limitation of time, space and causation, then we would like to go back to that part of consciousness which is free from these limitations. The same technique, learning technique. Pull out conscious awareness or attention from experience that is bound in time, space and causation and be aware Put your awareness upon that experience which does not follow the laws of time, space and causation. But is there any conscious experience which does not follow these laws that we know of? Because I can't talk of any experiences that will happen somewhere else. In all my talks, I have emphasized that we have to confine ourselves to human awareness as we know it. I am talking for the common man which anyone should be able to understand, what should be with him. Yes, there are conscious experiences which transcend the laws of time, space and causation and we are all aware of it. What are those experiences? I'll give you some examples. The experience of the intuitive hunch, the intuitive process. Intuitively knowing something, we all know it. We all get that hunch once in a while. It's just going to happen. We know it. How much time does that intuitive process take to give that message? No time at all. Not, we can't say that intuition took place in two minutes or two seconds or a millionth part of a second. It does not take even a billionth part of a nanosecond, which itself is a billionth part of a second. It takes no time. The intuitive knowledge is there or not there. When it's there, it has come without time. Where does it come from? We can't locate it. It's just there in consciousness, in awareness. We know it. It has come as a hunch. We know it. When we think about what has happened, then we take time, because that's the mind, thinking. We say, how did it know this? And we reject it. Very often, we use the thinking mind in time to reject the intuitive message coming outside time. The mind in time is used to reject the information, knowledge, which comes into consciousness by the intuitive process outside of time. Take another example, love, the experience of love. When you have the experience of love, can you say how long it takes for the experience to occur? It is just there or not there. To think how it happened, what happened, whether it has happened or not, whether it's real or not, you can take hours and days and the whole lifetime with the mind. But when that happens, it has just happened. And that experience of love, the experience of identifying yourself with another, when that occurs, it takes no time, no space, and does not follow the laws of cause and effect. A third example, the experience of beauty, any aesthetic experience. You see something and you have a sense of beauty. You stand on top of a hill, 
and the landscape gives you suddenly a sense of beauty. Where does it come from? Not from the landscape. Because if you try to analyze with the mind, is it from here, there, are the trees contributing to it, or the ocean, or the cloud, it disappears. That is so elusive. When you had it, it hit you with beauty, filled you up. When it filled you, it did not take any time. It was just there. In fact, all these experiences which I am narrating, the experience of intuition, experience of beauty, experience of love, they, are, they never occur as events. They are there and we notice it's there. The noticing of it, the observing of it, the contemplation of it, the thinking of it takes time and is a mental function. But the existence of this conscious experience is, is, is there, it's just there, out of time, space and causation. Then we have a part of consciousness of which we are partially aware even now, which functions outside the frame of time, space and causation. Can't we then, through a deeper process of meditation, through a more meaningful and a higher system of meditation or self-realization, discover that part of consciousness which transcends even this frame of time, space and causation? Of course we can. When we pull our attention from all experiences framed in time, space and causation and allow wakeful experience to stay in that which is timeless, in these kinds of experiences, the intuitive process, when we live in intuitive process and not in the rest, we discover a part of consciousness, the part of our real self, which is responsible for all experience. And we discover that that is the real generator and perceiver of all experience. That part of consciousness has been called in the East as the human soul to distinguish it from the mind. The mind has been defined as that part of human consciousness which puts experience into the frame of time, space and causation. And soul is, is considered, is defined as that part of human consciousness which takes experience outside the limitations of time, space and causation. The human soul is then the real self because it frees us from the frame of the mind. I am making this point because in the West not much distinction is made between the mind and the soul. I have met some people interested in consciousness but they have not made that kind of a distinction between consciousness operating in time, space and causation and consciousness not so operating. The reason is that most of our investigations we make with the mind. Even our study of our own self is limited by a study of the mind. And therefore we say, what happened in the beginning? We want to know. No one says, what happened before there was any beginnings? We all pose our questions in time. We even restrict God to a mental level and say, in the beginning God must have done this. That means beginning was more important than God. If the beginning existed before God, then beginning was more important than God. Who created the beginning in which God came and started work? Then time we are making as a super God. This whole concept of the existence of consciousness outside the frame of time is new to the West. And Western philosophy has continued to pose these questions. Religion has pumped up all these stories into time frames. Because that's the only way the mind understands. The mind naively asks, Okay, we believe you that their time was created at a time. We want to know what happened before that. Look at the contradiction. If time was not there, what could be before or after? This question of before and after arises with time. And all these questions we put about what happened first or later, what is there and here, all arise from an assumption that time space is already there. These are all questions posed within the intellectual frame of time, space and causation. When we want to ask more basic questions about consciousness, transcending the intellectual frame, transcending that of which the intellect is capable, then we cannot use the intellectual communication as a means of investigation. But we can use consciousness still, because it is there. We can still use the intuitive process. Intuition is not bound down by time, space and causation. Intuitive investigation can take us into realms of 
self consciousness of consciousness of the self even beyond time space and causation so when we free ourselves from the bondage of time space and causation we discover that mind or time space causation framework was merely a device to have experience in a particular way called experience in time experience with events experience with beginning middle and end then the experience of the soul is the experience of timeless adventure of consciousness that means we have now discovered the self there could be no problem about that but there is one problem those who have gone deeper into this question have discovered that we are not still free we have removed only these covers this is very gross was obvious this physical body was too obvious to require any sophistication of study sense perceptions looked little more sophisticated we but we could disassociate ourselves with them and say we are conscious even without them mind was the hardest to remove because to say that i am not the mind and mind is something else being used by me is the hardest part of the study but we do manage under superior guidance under very specialized kind of training we can manage to discover the identity of consciousness of the self independent from the mind which is creating time space illusions but what is now left by way of imperfection in this experience of consciousness which we call the soul there is still one imperfection left and that is the imperfection of individuation have we not bound this consciousness even freed from time space and causation into what looks like an individuated experience is this individuation an essential part of consciousness of course not why should it be are we not limiting consciousness are we not limiting ourselves by a very very subtle kind of wall of individuation now and should we not free ourselves from that to discover what we are we discover that finally we are in fact still having a very thin cover upon our own self upon our own consciousness called individuation even the soul of human beings which we call pure human consciousness is pure individuated human consciousness therefore it still suffers from the infirmity from the limitation of individuation if we remove the subtle cover of human consciousness then we attain what could be called appropriately as total consciousness then total human consciousness freed from this subtle layer of individuation would be our real true self our true self even that which functions now in which we perceive the drama going on around us is in fact total consciousness then what is this total consciousness is it not true that that is what we mean by god is it not true that when we say when we talk of god and give him certain definitions definitions like he is omnipresent omnipotent omniscient take these three definitions we all give throughout the world wherever we use the word god can there be any other god except total consciousness which fulfills these three consciousness is in everything because you are it's not there without consciousness nothing comes into being unless you are conscious of it no experience is generated unless you are conscious of it then in every experience there is consciousness in every thing there is consciousness and consciousness is one it's total would it not be right then to say that total consciousness alone is omnipresent omniscient omnipotent is there anything else alternative to this which could have these qualities i am afraid we have not been able to find any alternative to this the best definition i have discovered so far of god is that he is total consciousness in which case self realization means the same thing as god realization because self realization has led us to the discovery that we in our real self are total consciousness which means that in our real self in reality we are god and there is nothing else that the rest is only an experience of the total consciousness within itself the experience of the grand experiencer which we call total consciousness is called creation and total consciousness is called the creator 
and as the experience restricts awareness to an individuated experience, it creates the many in illusion. This illusion then leads to further illusions, the illusion of putting that experience only into time, space and causation. A further illusion of having that experience in time, space and causation divided functionally into hearing, touching, seeing, smelling, so on. And finally, the grossest illusion of saying that the whole thing is bundled up in this physical system, which we call the human body, and we say, ah, oh, that must be the self, and everything else is in it. Which is right. Everything else is in it. We have discovered that. If we said that all these covers, I would take my jacket off if I go somewhere, but it doesn't become me. But as I carry it, I say, I'm coming. When I come, I take my jacket along. It doesn't make me the jacket, but the jacket becomes part of me while I go along. In the same way, for the purpose of experience, for the purpose of conscious experience, we carry the whole paraphernalia of these illusory covers which heighten the effect of the illusion and make it a drama worth watching, worth living in. Total consciousness is playing a beautiful game of creating illusions which we call creation. And why is it doing all this? Why should the creator or total consciousness create all this illusion and all this drama in the first place. It does so because that's the only way it survives. Consciousness cannot survive unless it has something to be conscious of. If nothing is left to be conscious of, there is no consciousness either. We would use some other word. If we use words like consciousness or awareness, it implies automatically that there is something to be aware of, to be conscious of. It may be the same thing. Consciousness may be conscious of itself. In what form? Then it takes a form. If it is formless, it takes formlessness. It must manifest. It need not be a form. It must manifest. Whatever manifests is creation. And the one that becomes conscious of that manifestation becomes the creator. It's a simple device to sustain consciousness. Total consciousness has to be conscious because it wouldn't be including us who are conscious beings. Therefore, the whole discovery of what is the Self is a discovery progressively of our own nature of consciousness when it is experienced without the covers that surround it. The covers being the outer cover of the physical body, the inner cover of the sense perceptions, which we sometimes refer to as the astral body, the still inner cover of the mind, which we sometimes refer to as the causal body, the still inner cover of the soul, of individuated consciousness, which we call the soul. And finally, our real self in terms of consciousness, which is total consciousness, which is also known as God. This is the story of man's quest for the self. This is the answer to the question, what is the self? The self is total consciousness. The self is God. Why don't we know it? Because of the illusion of the covers. Why are the illusions there? To sustain the drama for that consciousness. The Socratic challenge that we should know ourselves has been made again and again because in spite of the clear answer we have given, the human mind limits it to the intellectual level, to the time frame, does not let us pierce through. Each generation must find its own answer. Each individual must find his own answer. And therefore, this question is posed again and again and we discover the same answer again and again. We have not found any other answer. This is the only answer that, uh, that is ever found. That what is self? Self is God. God is total consciousness and is found within our own selves. All practitioners of self-realization have said the same thing. None has said anything different from this. All we have to know is whether we can also realize it. Of course, that's the only way to realize it. What good is it if somebody else realizes it? How good is it? How is it good for me? The only convincing answer I can give to myself is, can I have that experience? If the answer is yes, it's worthwhile. If the answer is no, it's not worthwhile for me. And these practitioners say, since the answer is within you, you have to see not some other total consciousness anywhere else, but your own totality. It becomes easy for all of us to experience totality. That is how the self is discovered within the self, and each one of us can discover it. Thank you very much.